Hello and welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Pakistan is in the midst of turmoil, domestic, political and economic. But the most interesting facet of that turmoil is the man who's come out hitting sixer after sixer despite being in prison. It's former Pakistan cricket captain Imran Khan and former prime minister. Now, Imran Khan has been in prison for over a year now and he's taken on literally every major institution in Pakistan and somehow the establishment can't seem to keep Imran Khan down. The longer he stays in prison, it seems, the more powerful he grows. I am joined today by a very special guest, Bajahat Saeed Khan, journalist based in the United States, who knows Pakistan possibly more than any other journalist. Bajahat, welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Sandy, good to be here and good to reconnect after so long. After so long, we've been tracking your uh, Mahaz, uh, Vajat. We must say that you've got the inside news on Pakistan. And of course, you've done exceptionally well to literally put your uh, professional career on the line with the kind of reportage that you brought us from Pakistan. It's it's an incredible uh, uh, feat that you've achieved, uh, Vajat. We're all proud of the work that you've been doing. But, you know, break down for our viewers, what's going on in Pakistan right now? There's so much that seems to be happening. There's talk of a military trial for Imran Khan, constitutional amendments. He's clearly the most popular leader right now. Tell us why the establishment is gunning after him. Anti-corruption cases, all kinds of things. Thanks, Andy. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a gig, just like you and millions of other journalists across the world. Uh, we're just trying to do our best. But when it comes to uh, understanding Pakistan, considering it's uh, Halloween season here in the US, I'm just uh, going to start with the horror show analogy uh, that uh, um, it's it's sort of Halloween every night these days uh, in Pakistan. Um, economically, uh, the turmoil uh, is, as you would know from the Indian perspective, um, the race is lost. There is no catching up with India. Uh, Pakistan is on uh, life support from the IMF and various other donors. In fact, Pakistan is right now struggling to keep up with a program not for loans, but for a program which pays for loans, which pay for loans. It's that bad. Uh, then, of course, um, comes uh, the security struggle. Um, uh, while the Indian border is quiet, uh, the other two, the Western border in Balochistan and Khabar Pakhtunkhwa uh, have uh, really, really surged up. In fact, since the Taliban took over in 2020, uh, fatalities, uh, cross-border incidents, uh, as well as terrorism incidents inland have uh, multiplied threefold, triple-digit uh, fatalities, uh, triple-digit uh, casualty surges uh, on both borders uh, in two of Pakistan's western provinces. And then when we really just talk about the mainland, then it's just political chaos. Uh, started exactly around two, two and a half years ago, but really centered around the one man you've named, uh, Imran Khan, the Khan of Khans, uh, who has never failed uh, to disappoint uh, his uh, cricket audiences, but now doesn't fail to disappoint his uh, uh, political audiences either. Uh, I left the US, I left for the US uh, five years ago because Imran Khan was disappointing, at least me. Uh, he was uh, uh, lockstep with the military. Uh, that was when he was elected in 2018 19. But when he was kicked out of office by what was obviously an engineered and a very well engineered vote of no confidence uh, in 2022, which brought back the old school parties, uh, the parties of Nawaz Sharif, uh, the industrialists from central Punjab, and the parties of uh, Bilawal and Asif Zardari, Bilawal Bhutto and Asif Zardari, the landlord feudals uh, from the south uh, near um, the Rajasthan border in Sindh. Um, well, it really became something different. Khan has become an emblem, a symbol, a poster boy uh, of uh, resistance. Uh, he's uh, half uh, uh, Che Guevara, uh, half uh, uh, Winston Churchill. <laughs> he's fighting uh, what uh, he thinks is uh, fascism. Uh, that's uh, what uh, his uh, millions of his followers uh, do every day on social media, which has become a front line, a mahaz, so to say. Uh, which I am a part of as well, but of course, as a commentator. Um, but really, the battle is uh, on multiple levels. On social media, which the authorities have tried to ban, influence, curtail, firewall, uh, lockdown. Um, on uh, 
uh, uh, the streets of Pakistan, where now uh, we are back into rally season. There's a rally coming up in the next uh, week or so, and it'll be a decisive rally, um, uh, perhaps because it'll be in the political heartland of Pakistan, which is Lahore. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, in the judiciary, which is where Imran was losing steam with almost 200 cases filed against him over the last uh, couple of years. But he's really now boiled down to just he's in for no case in particular. He's just in 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 in, in still in custody uh, now, almost uh, 15 right. months in because right. of uh, more and more cases they keep throwing his way. But the judiciary seems to be turning a corner for him. Meanwhile, the government led by the old school parties, PMLN and the PPP, um, and their new backer, the army, which has usually been a nemesis of yes. uh, those two parties, but is now their biggest ally sponsor backer. Uh, they don't seem to have uh, any idea what to do. They're losing the street. Uh, they're losing the press. They're losing the judiciary. They're definitely losing international importance and legitimacy. And this one man from behind bars has uh, uh, not brought them on their knees. But, uh, well, let's just say uh, they're going to be needing some painkillers every night before they go to bed, all of these guys. Absolutely. That's how bad it is. It's uh, Halloween season, as you put it, uh, Wajahat. But the fact is... <laughs> the horror show, unending uh, horror show. And, uh, uh, you know, troubles, as you said, they come in battalions. Now, uh, you know, <laughs> tell us this. How did Imran Khan, who was seen as a poster boy for the army, uh, you know, a puppet, as they called him a couple of years back when he was brought in in an election, how did he turn uh, against the establishment? And, uh, you know, how did someone who was seen as a creation of the army, turn on the army, and today he is the most popular leader in Pakistan by far. His party won the maximum number of seats, fell short of a majority. If the elections had been free and fair, there's no doubt the PTI would have won by a landslide. Explain for us, for our viewers, when did Khan turn the corner and become uh, what he is today, this Che Guevara figure that you mentioned? Yeah, uh, good, uh, good question. So uh, I think uh, the uh, firstly, it's unfair to say that Khan is a poster boy or was a poster boy uh, for uh, the army. If that um, yardstick is used, that the army must bless and give its ashirwad to every uh, um, premier who assumes office, then frankly, uh, Pakistan has had a lot of poster boys and girls for that matter. Uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, uh, of course, the, the famous prime minister who was hung by the army yes. um, in the 70s. Well, he was a product of the army's uh, cabinet in the 50s and 60s when he was foreign minister in a military regime. Nawaz Sharif uh, was um, the chief minister of Punjab, which is where he started off in, his, in the 80s uh, in, in politics during a military regime. These guys were patronized, backed, in fact, created, uh, groomed, to use a word, uh, uh, from um, GHQ. So everybody who's has ever assumed office in an interim role as premier or even as a, in an elected capacity has always had army backing. Now, to what extent have they had army backing? To what, uh, to how much election engineering they've enjoyed from the military and the intelligence apparatus which the military uh, runs? That's a separate story. But I can tell you very clearly that Imran Khan was never a poster boy. However, much like any other politician who was gunning for the top office before him, he needed military support. He right. got military support for the military's own purposes. But when those purposes ran out, after between he was premier for 2018 to 2022, uh, when those when those purposes ran out, when the military thought that it would decide to repivot, perhaps there was too much of a game changer in him. He was trying to do his own thing in the Middle East. He was definitely. Um, going eyeball to eyeball with uh, Prime Minister Modi, especially after the Pulwama incident, uh, which we saw uh, before the turn of the last decade. Um, in all of this, Khan was emerging as a, not just, not much of a thinking man, but a man with his own mind. Let's just say that. He had a mind of his own, perhaps not the greatest uh, foreign policy strategist in, our, in, our, uh, in modern history, right. but definitely a man who wanted an independent foreign policy. He managed COVID pretty well. Um, when things were good during his regime well, with the with the army, they were good. Pakistan did a pretty good job, definitely a better job than any other country, including India in the region, to yes. curtail COVID casualties. But uh, uh, when things were bad, well, 
<laughs> this is bad. I think they, uh, the, the, the psychoanalysts at uh, military headquarters have not really uh, done a very good job in assessing that this man, uh, one of the greatest cricketing minds, one of the greatest uh, leaders in modern yes. sports history, uh, well, he had ideas of his own. And while right. he used sport, like any wily politician would, to get into office, he right. also went for them when they kicked him out. I think they misread that. Plus, there's always the Pathan X factor, Sandy, which cannot be <laughs> yes. counted out. The man's yes. a Pathan. He's a he's a he's a loose cannon like the rest of us Pathans. Absolutely, and never <laughs> anger them, whether they're in politics or in the media. You can't count them out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so Vajat, now you know. One of my favorite Pakistani movies is this iconic film from the 1970s, Mola Jat. Of course. And of course. you spoke about uh, Imran Khan becoming his own man and coming into uh, becoming a politician on his, of his own uh, standing. Now, what about the other man in the equation? Is there a Nuri nut in uniform at GHQ, Rawal Pindi? Is this actually a battle between Mola Jat and Nuri nut? You know who I'm yeah. talking about, General Asim. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mola Jat, of course, the, the, the legendary Punjabi warrior, Nuri yes. Nath, his, uh, uh, his nemesis. I think there is uh, clearly uh, Nuri Nath. And this is not just me saying this. Uh, Imran has himself uh, uh, said this, that this is really about, uh, uh, this is personal right. um, between uh, him and uh, General uh, Asim Munir, who is... Uh, technically uh, just a grade 22 officer like uh, every other uh, military general in the subcontinent but uh, a little more than that beyond he's de facto uh, the 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 uh, the ruler of pakistan yes. uh, if not de jure so yes uh, because the military wields so much power and because it is a very very disciplined institution yeah. um, even if it is about uh, between asim munir and imran even if it is sandy let's just go with imran's narrative that Asim Munir is compromised, that Asim Munir has um, done deals with the uh, Nawaz and uh, the Bhuttos and uh, uh, the Brits and the Martians and everybody else in the middle, right? Let's just go with Imran Khan and his party's narrative that Asim Munir has, is compromised. Then, uh, e even then, Asim Munir is nothing on his own without the backing of the 750,000 man Pakistan Army, Pakistan Navy, Pakistan Air Force, and very importantly, Pakistan's ISI, which right. is a state, which is a state to itself, and which, by the way, he has the distinction of uh, being one of the few army chiefs uh, to have commanded uh, that organization. Possibly uh, now, only the second uh, DG ISI to become army chief. Correct. General uh, Kayani. The, correct. The first DG ISI was General Kayani, and uh, it was uh, under General Kayani's uh, 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 regime when the Mumbai attacks happened. Just for context for uh, your viewers. Of so course. yes. Um, the um, the tradition of uh, the army being ruled, uh, the army being run by a non-intel, a non-intelligence background general has been broken by Kayani, but it's really been, it's really gone to the next level with Asim Munir. And uh, the ISI, as you know, as any Indian would know, uh, the ISI has a role in the region, of course, uh, it, but uh, it's also got a role within Pakistan. And a lot of Indians might not... Uh, uh, be uh, well, very well versed that uh, intelligence agency run by the military polices internally as aggressively as it patrols externally. Uh, and that is what the ISI is very good at. It might not be very good at, uh, for example, its, uh, its uh, a military role vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, as we saw in 65 and 71, and perhaps even in 99, but it's very, very good internally. It's way better, let's just say, in policing Pakistan than it is at pestering India. The and political that, wing of the ISI. But, you know, uh, Vajat, uh, right. sorry to interrupt. And that's, you, what but... he's, that's what he's got the backing of. And yes. that, makes him more th that makes this more than just personal. It's actually, he is the institution. He represents the institution of the Pakistan military. Faiz Hamid uh, is the other person I want to ask you about, talking about DG ISIs. You have a DG, a former DG ISI in prison, unprecedented again. It is. Um, several uh, three-star generals have been court-martialed um, in the past or investigated, but not but not uh, tried and uh, imprisoned this way, which goes on to underscore that how Asim Munir has succeeded by hook or by crook, but I would say by the sh by sheer discipline of what the Pakistan Army uh, uh, stands for. 
The Pakistan army has uh, several weaknesses, but its biggest strength is its discipline. Right. And the fact that there hasn't been a colonel's coup like there have been in borders further in countries further west of Pakistan goes on to indicate that it has uh, that um, um, solidarity, that it will fall in line with the chief, even if the chief is giving illegal orders or even if the chief seems to be out of his mind, which seems to be the current case yes. where the army is plowing through, bulldozing through with the chief's orders and vision to really go all out for Pakistan's most popular man, Imran, and his supporters, million, millions of them, even at the cost of its own popularity. Um, but um, more than that, uh, beyond the street, the case of Fez Hamid is interesting because Fez Hamid was not just a personal rival for uh, the chiefdom of the army, between Asim Munir and uh, Faiz Hamid was a race of who would become the military chief. Uh, Faiz Hamid was Imran's favorite. That's one of the reasons Imran fell out with the army because Imran wanted to, well, sort of gerrymander the army's uh, protocol and uh, uh, promotion uh, possibilities when it came to supporting Faiz Hamid. But also, uh, Asim Munir has a lot of problems internally to deal with. There are a lot of officers, or at least there were a lot of serving officers, who like Imran Khan. And you know why? He's a likable fellow. Because that's what the army has been telling, not just the rest of the planet, but also its own men and women and officers and uh, soldiers for the last um, almost two decades. The army's biggest problem about Imran Khan is the army itself. They have convinced through their intelligence apparatus, through the media apparatus, through their propaganda apparatus, Pakistani soldiers and Pakistani civilians that the Nawaz and Bhutto regimes are corrupt. And this is a third option. Please vote for him. And this is the support Imran, which you mentioned, had. Yes. And now all of a sudden, within the span of months, they're right. saying, you turn, you know, and you can't do an about turn. Maybe in a military marching band, you can. Yeah. But, but when, but when you know, you, you, you actually drink the Kool-Aid, in my <laughs> case, Gatorade, when you drink the when you drink the Kool-Aid, right. um, it's difficult to move on. So, Fez Hamid is an example right. of Asimir's uh, problems within the army where hundreds of officers besides Fez, Fez Hamid yes. have been arrested or fired or sacked or suspended or investigated for supporting or having sympathies for Imran Khan. That is a huge a purge yeah. which we haven't seen in years within the military. At least two of his uh, top commanders uh, besides uh, Faiz Hamid was retired, Sandy, but two co-commanders right. have been fired within the space of a year. That's nine co -com out of nine co-commanders in total. That's right. huge. That doesn't happen. Absolutely. I mean, it's unprecedented from whatever we're seeing of Pakistan, the kind of events that are playing out there. But Wajahat, what is it that we're hearing about, a, a, you know, a, a feared military trial for Imran Khan, constitutional amendments, uh, you know, makes sense for us uh, from all of this. Is the establishment kind of losing patience uh, with the judiciary? The fact that they've not been able to convict Imran Khan and let's just get him however we can. Is that what the approach is currently? Yeah, it's a scorched earth approach. I think uh, they're throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at trying to um, get this man, this beast, this animal uh, down and who just refuses uh, to go away. I mean, think about it. 50, almost 15, 16 months now in prison, and he's still, according to every uh, survey, uh, poll analysis, still powerful. He's still the most followed man on social media. Um, his word is the law. Uh, if he says something, things happen. If he says, have a rally, hundreds of thousands of people turn up from all over Pakistan to a particular point. Um, it's, it's astounding the power he wields. And it's also astounding how bad the military-backed regime's uh, prosecution has been. Over 200 cases from stealing watches to um, uh, marrying or not marrying his own wife, right? Everything from adultery uh, to even uh, having an illegitimate child out of wedlock. Everything has been thrown at him and nothing has stuck. It shouldn't be Imran Khan anymore. It should be Teflon Khan. Because Teflon nothing, Khan, indeed. Yeah, because because nothing, nothing, uh, nothing uh, sticks. Nothing. But sticks. Yes. but the 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 more disturbingly, uh, beyond this isn't beyond Khan. The constitutional amendment, the 26th constitutional amendment, which you just mentioned, 
is yeah. actually beyond Khan. Khan's what in his early seventies now. Even even if he comes back, maybe he gets another term. Maybe he gets yeah. two terms. Right. Um, but but the fact that the constitution is being changed to make sure that he doesn't return, to yeah. make sure that the people in, in currently in power, like the Chief Justice of Pakistan, who's anti Khan, like the Army Chief who is anti Khan, yes. like this dispensation which is anti Khan, remains on. They're literally changing the constitution to keep him in prison or his party banned Sandy. That's how right. much of a threat this man is. He refuses to go away for them. And that is a, a cost the rest of Pakistan will bear because what they're really trying to change right. is the structure of the judiciary, the structure of politics, the structure of bureaucracy, and not to get into too many details, but yes. millions of Pakistanis not even born today Right. will bear the cost of uh, the the structures they're trying to change. And I hope that this uh, the, the, the latest campaign by the government and the military to change the constitution, to make it less to make the judiciary less independent, really stops. And because it's it's beyond Khan, I think that the best way forward right now is for all parties to sit down and talk it out, which right. is the way civilized nations work. And, you know, talking of, uh, you know, leaders, extremely popular leaders like Imran Khan. I can't but think of uh, one leader from 1971 who stood up to the Pakistan military. You've mentioned that in the past as well, Wajat. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, do you see the military getting a second chance now with Imran Khan? That Let's not make the same mistake that we did with Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in 1971. Let's talk to Imran Khan. Do you see the military actually coming around to this? Or will they take the other darker route, which is 1977, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, we know what happened there with Ziaul Haq uh, judicially assassinating a former president of Pakistan. What's your take on it? Yeah, I like your I like your uh, your time traveling to the 70s spot on, uh, spot on. And um, firstly, it's not just you or me who think about it. Imran himself has warned about not recreating a 1971-like crisis, and he's done it uh, uh, much to his chagrin. In fact, they've thrown a couple of cases at him for mentioning um, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, the uh, Bengali leader uh, from uh, East, formerly known as East Pakistan, current Bangladesh um, uh, dispensation. Yes, you're right. Uh, there is that comparison drawn. But you know, there's that old saying, Sandy, uh, and you would, who would know this better than you? You're a military historian yourself, that the only thing uh, more difficult than putting a uh, new idea into an army is taking an old idea out of it. And uh, these guys think like infantrymen. Uh, they think like uh, they need to get from A to B and they have X many men and the obstacles have to be surpassed from with one form or the other and they will take hits, but they have to get to the objective. Right. The objective, political elimination of Imran Khan. They're perhaps not really in touch with the street. They're not really reading the media well. I don't know what sort of newspapers they're reading, but clearly controlling uh, Pakistan through uh, a scary uh, North Korea-like apparatus is not going to change Pakistan. The comparison to Bhutto is often drawn as well. But let me remind you, when they hung Bhutto in yes. 1979, Bhutto was not very popular. Uh, Bhutto had, in fact, uh, gerrymandered uh, the election. Yes. Uh, Bhutto, the, the country wasn't uh, um, uh, sure there was no social media at the time, but hundreds of thousands of people were not collecting in Lahore and Islamabad for yes. Bhutto. People weren't marching the streets, people weren't distributing t-shirts, not that there were t-shirts were popular at that time. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is that Bhutto was a charismatic figure, yes. He did go to town on the army, yes. They did go to town on him and kill him, yes. But was he as popular as this man from this moment? No. And to go back to your 1971 problem, Pakistan's western provinces, which clearly back Imran Khan because A, he's popular there, B, he's a Pathan. Yeah. Pakistan's western provinces have sort of become its East Pakistan now. Yes. Uh, they are uh, downtrodden. They feel isolated. And it's that sliver in the middle, that Punjab sin sliver in the middle, which always uh, felt like it could represent Pakistan, uh, which first the Bengalis fought with in the 70s. And now the Pathan and Baloch are fighting with in the two in the 2020s it's really 50 years later the punjabis uh, have already done what they did to the bengalis in the political imagination and narrative and now in the same political imagination and narrative the pathans and the baloch think that the punjabi and the sindhi complex the establishment or the mill establishment uh, which rules pakistan 
is out to divide it yet again. So there are clear, clear connections to the ethnic component of all of this, which right. we never talked about, which is the least talked about in all of this.